Having spelled spark the interest of both critics and audiences alike with his 1994 debut shopping, Paul W.S. Anderson headed to Hollywood where his debut had de- generated interest among studio heads after the film was shown at the Sundance Film Festival. Now released in 1995 and based on the popular and highly controversial video game Mortal Kombat, saw Anderson make his first ad- adapting a video game for the screen, while at the same time heavily borrowing from the framework for Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon, as the battle for the fate of Earthrealm is decided in the title of tournament i'm elwood i'm kim and you're listening to movies and tea let's take it to the booth First of all, welcome to uh, episode two of Movies and Tea, and today we are going to obviously be looking at Mortal Kombat, possibly one of the better known uh, sort of titles on Paul W. S. Anderson's resume, um, outside of like the Resident Evil films. I would say Mortal Kombat is one of the films that everybody knows, and it's one that you either absolutely adore or you just don't see the appeal of. I think it falls in uh, you fall in one of those two camps. Uh, certainly for myself, like seeing this back when it was originally released back in 1975, this was like the sleepover movie of choice. If you went to like a birthday party or something and they didn't show Mortal Kombat, then it was no good. It's like the whole night was ruined. But um, I mean, Kim, did you see this back when it was released or did you sort of see this later in life? Uh, I feel like I've seen it before. Um, a lot of the stuff feels very familiar, but somehow I feel like this is the... When I was re-watching it for this, yeah. it felt like this. I was recepting a lot more. But then, you know, I have this feeling that a lot of fighting games have the same setup. Whereas, like, I sometimes confuse it and I'm like, wait, did I? What am I confusing it with DOA, which was much worse? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I can see where, like, Mortal Kombat really is, like... It's not like, you know, I mean, objectively speaking, obviously, if you're completely objective about the movie itself, you'll, it, it's definitely not perfect. There, but for what it is and how it's not serious and how it's just really, really just like a fun take on like the game itself, you know, I mean, fighting games in general, they don't really like, I mean, they don't really have much story to it. Obviously, like people who played Mortal Kombat 10 might actually, you know, uh, MKX have a lot more uh, background to it, a lot more depth, and a lot more cutscenes, for example. Uh, but I mean, like back in the days, the Mortal Kombat games, I never remembered them to have a lot of like uh, story to it. The concept was it was to be kind of like a competitor to, like, say, Street Fighter or something, which was kind of dominating the market back then. Yeah, I mean, this was obviously brought out as the main sort of rival to Street Fighter, in particular Street Fighter 2. What Mortal Kombat obviously gave us, which Street Fighter didn't really give us, was first of all, blood, and second of all, fatalities. And if you're a young boy who's hanging around arcades and stuff, these are the sort of things that are going to instantly appeal to your appeal to your little bloodthirsty nature. And unsurprisingly, when it was released for the Hong Kong the whole console market became like a huge success um certainly with both like the snares and the mega drive versions they did try and tone down the violence and i think that was another sort of rite of passage and you know knowing the blood code for to, for use on the mega drive to reinstate all the gore and i think certainly when we look at this film it does a really good job of adapting adapting uh what more combat is and putting it onto screen i mean Mortal Kombat was released on the sort of the tail end of several failed video game movies. We had had Double Dragon, which was awful. We had Super Mario Brothers, which is its own brand of awful. And we had uh, Street Fighter, which Jean-Claude Van Damme actually turned down this film to do. 
Um, he was originally going to play the Johnny Cage role. I mean, he was the inspiration for the character in the video game. And the idea was that he was going to come aboard and play the Johnny Cage role in the film as well. Um, but he decided that Street Fighter and hanging out with Kylie Minogue was going to be a much better career path for him. And, uh, well, I think we all know how Street Fighter turned out. I know people listening to that, there's probably some people at home that are like, oh, Street Fighter is like the greatest movie ever because it's got this strange cult following which i've never understood um yeah but then i mean like if you think about it there are people who look at us who are talking about mortal Kombat and being like you know it's a it's a really fun fighting game they're like no it was really dumb you know like i don't yeah. understand why you like it you know sort of thing obviously like i i'm kind of in the middle path um i do acknowledge everything that's good but it's one that like it's kind of like how you feel about i guess sharknado it would be one of those examples where like, you you know it's not a good film, but you just love it for all its badness and, and all its snarkiness and all its sarcasm and just all the, like, little crappy dialogue bits. And But yet you know it fits so well because it works so well with the tone of the game that, that it was based on. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, certainly when we look at how Anderson's directing this film and with this film certainly we do start to see a lot of his sort of trademarks making their first appearance which we will talk about in a bit but you can tell that when he's looked at the the game he's sort of figured out very early on what the sort of key elements are and as with many of Anderson's films the rules of 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 the film are very simple they're very easy to pull. um here in Mortal Kombat is basically the forces of Outworld can't, uh, trying to invade Earth Realm, which is Earth, and the only way that they can do it is by winning ten straight Mortal Kombat tournaments. Now, at the moment, they've won nine, and we are now entering into the tenth sort of key tournament. And in order to stop the forces of Outworld, uh, led by the evil sorcerer Shao Kahn, the Thunder God Raiden, uh, here played by. Cr- Christopher Lambert, the famous French actor, because who better to play a Chinese thunder god than Christopher Lambert? But that being said, well, uh, well, well, back in the days, this whole uh, multicultural thing was not as big of an issue, I guess. So, if this movie released today, boy, would they be getting the Scarlett Johansson treatment? So, I mean, he rounds up, we've got the Shaolin monk, Liu Kang, who's entering the tournament because he wants to avenge his brother who was killed by Shao Kahn. We've got the movie star, Johnny Cage, who has been branded as a fake by the press, and he's, like, determined to prove that he's not. And then we've got the military officer, Sonya Blade, who is basically trying to uh, take revenge on the crime boss, Kano, who has been uh, picked up to represent Shao Kahn in the tournament, and... uh, these three fighters, they're rounded up by Raiden. They have no idea why they've been entered into this tournament. And as it sort of goes on, they sort of learn to accept that, you know, the fate of the world ha- lies in their hands. Um, I mean, this is a tournament which, it has to be said, it is kind of heavily stacked. That The fact you've got the the human fighters, and then Shao Kahn's got his supernatural fighters. So we've got, like, <laughs> Sub-Zero, who's got the power of ice. We've got Scorpion, who's got a living... Uh, spear weapon and when we got like the multi-armed goro so you can't help but feel the deck is more than a little stacked against the first of alpha realm but again this perfectly keeps in tone of what the game's about it's about this idea of these fantastical fighters meeting in a tournament and beating the seven shades out of each other which is essentially what we get here you know but i think that you know i think that here's a good time to talk about say like the fighting scenes a little and I feel that that's where the movie kind of falls flat a little in the sense that the fighting scenes never feel very satisfying. It's like it feels really choreographed for for like the supernatural people. They seem like they don't put a much of a fight. (laughs) (laughs) And I think it has to do a lot with like just maybe the budget and maybe the fact that, um, you know, it is the 1990s and there's some crappy CGI to match with all of this. Okay, I mean, the CGI back in 95 was impressive. Now, yeah. not so much. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. no, I, like, you can, look, you can look past that. But I think that the, the, the entertaining part of it was, was the fact that, you know, like, it would, you would have thought, like, the most entertaining part of the fights in this movie was the fact that you got to see the, the, the Mortal Kombat song come up and you were like, oh, yeah, this is so good. The soundtrack is amazing, you know? <laughs> 
Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, the iconography is there. Like you see the dragon logo, and in the beginning, I mean, the opening is just basically the dragon logo. There's no like cast members or anything listed. It's just this bloody dragon logo. Yeah, seeing the fire and flames for, and it's like that uh, opening theme tune, which. As soon as you hear it, it's sort of like, oh, it's just game on. It's like when you hear the uh, opening orchestral chords to Battle Royale. It's like, no matter how tired or what you are, if you have, like, flicked through the channels and you hear that coming, it's like, that's it. I'm just, like, locked in now for, like, the whole of this film. In terms of the actual fight choreography, I mean, one of the advantages of the, the film, I mean, the choreography itself was handled by the same fight choreographer who did who did like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, he did the Craddock Kid movies, and he actually gave Robin Shaw a lot of freedom to when it came to doing the fight scenes. I mean, Robin Shaw uh, was basically when the film was first shown to a, like, the test audiences, it didn't test well, and they basically said they wanted to add more action. Now, Robin Shaw, he came up from a Hong Kong background. Um, he worked as a stuntman before he came over to America. I mean, he signed on to the film not actually knowing what Mortal Kombat was. Um, it's just his agent basically... He thought it was like a stupid idea and his agent was like, no, it's like this really big video game and it's like super popular and that's what he signed on for and he handled a lot of the, the sort of fight scenes and he was given a lot of freedom by Anderson just basically to do what he wanted and um, I think when you look at like the actual people who do uh, sort of like choreography uh, such as Robin Shaw and um, and uh, Lyndon Ashby who uh, who know much less I mean their sort of fight scenes stand out a lot better and certainly when we see like the scenes such as like uh, the Johnny Cage versus Scorpion or the Liu Kang versus Sub-Zero fights these sort of stand out more than like the trio versus like m the numerous minions that we see and in those cases it's kind of a little more of a, a slack through element to it the thing i do actually love about the fight when he's fighting uh sub-zero uh sub-zero is like surprisingly more acrobatic than he is in the game he's sort of like thrown <laughs> against walls and he's doing these flips down the ramp now robin Shaw was supposed to actually copy him sort of move for move but he couldn't do the acrobatic stuff so there's a shot of him running crazily down the ramp after sub-zero which was sort of like an end of the day thing and that's the shot that they surprisingly chose to use which is yeah. really random but i mean i really like the fightings i mean it's you can tell obviously as we said that the actors who are obviously trained martial art compared to those who aren't although it to her credit i mean bridget wilson who plays sonya blade did actually do all her own stunts. She actually, uh, I think she dislocated her shoulder during filming and managed to have it relocated so it didn't hinder anything. And certainly Lyndon Ashby got pretty beat up. Um, at one point, Anderson saying that he was like popping uh, painkillers like M&Ms. And uh, that was more the fault of Robin Shaw who was sort of like convinced Lyndon Ashby to take all these kicks. He's like saying, you know, take these hits. You'll come off looking like a hero for this. So, uh <laughs> This real Hong, Hong Kong style of filmmaking, perhaps uh, that Lynn Ashby probably wasn't used to, you know, having a slightly more cushy sort of filming style for American productions. Uh, I don't think he was used to getting beat up as much as Robin Shaw clearly was. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, like it, he started, he did start off with like a stuntman and stuff, right? So it's it's really like it's, it's like his everyday job for Robin Shaw. So it, it feels like it, it's like obviously we watch Hong Kong movies and. They've always been renowned for their martial arts and their fighting and their action films. So, obviously, like, the intensity of it is much harder than, say, like, I would imagine filming in Hollywood for something like this. And, you know, like, this, but that's, that really helps in the whole acting thing, where if you're feeling the pain, you can actually <laughs> reflect on it a little. Yeah, um, I mean... Just obviously speaking of of the cast, I mean, how did you find the cast? Because, I mean, there isn't a huge amount of well-known faces here. I mean, obviously, Bridget Wilson, she was doing things like Betty Madison. Um, I think the mo the main ones who sort of stood out were obviously Christopher Lambert, because he obviously was doing Highlander, and he was sort of like a, at the top of his uh, top of his popularity, really, around this period. Um the other sort of standout is Kari uh, Hiroyuki Tagawa, who, for myself, embodies Shang Tsung. I don't think that they could have got a better person to play it because he's just such a theatrical villain, and that's what you really need for this part. I mean, he's a sorcerer who can change shape. He can steal people's souls. Um, 
and someone like him just perfectly suited the role. Um, the other sort of standout for myself is Trevor Goddard, who is um, a British actor playing a Chinese crime boss who the Americans <laughs> all thought was Australian. So just uh, from my own personal perspective, I never cared for the character Kano when I played the games. And then I saw Mortal Kombat the film and suddenly Kano became like my favorite character of all time because of how Goddard plays him with this little like Cockney sort yeah. of buffoon swagger to him. Um, but the Americans audiences apparently thought it was Australian. So if you play the games, no, he's actually been changed from a Chinese crime boss to an Australian crime boss. Uh, just, just to obviously one of the few changes that was carried across in the film. No, I, I think I think I, I agree with um, a lot of what you're saying. I mean, Kano was really good. Uh, like Trevor Godard did a great job in portraying him. I don't really remember Kano in Mortal Kombat the game because I never like I, we talked about this off air and. I was saying how I never actually, like, played the game very in-depth, like, the earlier games, at least. Um, So, I mean, like, I think that... (laughs) In my notes, it says creepy man. (laughs) But it's it's, uh, Shang Shang Tsung. And (laughs) uh, he does a great job. I mean, he is supposed to be creepy, especially because, you know, he kind of has a thing for Sonya Blade. And he kind of, like... The, he is very theatrical, but I think that for a movie like this, it's all about being theatrical and being really, like, exaggerated in a lot of the things you do. And and that's where all your characters, charismas, and characters come out. And I think that for that, I mean, I think that Lyndon Ashby did a great job of Johnny Cage. I thought that he was really, really fun to watch. Mm. Um, I, th- I thought Sonia Blade was really fun to watch also. Um, she really had that, you know, like, female sass like she was trying to be like a strong female character um and she is supposed to be because you know she she does like she's like part of the SWAT team or something like that and she like gets tricked <laughs> tricked into the tournament in the beginning um yeah so i mean it's it's uh it's an interesting thing like i think that a lot of it is the it's the enjoyment of it is in see that exaggeration and with their facial expressions and um, Paul Anderson always does those like close up shots where it's either from upwards or facing them or something and you really get that like close up funny moment where you're just kind of like you don't know if you should laugh or not <laughs> um, but yeah so I mean <laughs> yeah no I thought the casting was really really great um, it, it really worked when we look at this cast I mean the sort of standout for myself is Robin Shaw I mean he embodies the character of Liu Kang and when he comes across this film, I mean, this is his first role in America prior to this, as we said already. He's working in Hong Kong. He's mainly doing sort of stunt work and fight choreography over there. And when this film comes out, I mean, he's so embodies the role um, with his sort of like fighting ability, his feathered <laughs> hair. I don't know what to, how best way to describe that man mullet thing he's got on his head. Um <laughs> But I thought that coming out of Mortal Kombat, that he would be much more of a... That he would have much more of a career than he ultimately did. I mean, he did Mortal Kombat, he did Annihilation, and he kind of disappeared. And he, I mean, he reappears in Death Race, and he did bits and pieces here and there, like Beverly Hills Ninja, but he never really seemed to get the grounding that uh, that I expected him to have coming out of this world. I mean... What was your sort of thoughts of Robin Shaw? I mean, did you did you see any sort of future sort of superstar talent there, or was he just sort of okay to you? I mean, I would think that like I don't think he was anything spectacular. I mean, he fit his role really well. I think that as what he did, he did a really good job in terms of just like a future. I I feel like people who do stunts as a start have a hard time coming out of getting bigger roles yeah you know maybe he's done smaller maybe he's done smaller roles i i don't i haven't really tracked his stuff um i was looking at it when i was researching his character for like uh his his acting um and like movies he's been in and it's really like little hearts in hong kong he did like a bunch of 80s movies and i think he was there for a part of 90s um there were some prominent titles like some more familiar ones but I wouldn't be surprised. Like maybe he, maybe like his stunt act, his stunt work was more. I don't know, thriving. I didn't look into that. So okay. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, as you, I mean, you mentioned already. I mean, when we look at his Hong Kong work, I mean, he was in Eastern Heroes in '91. He was in Cage in 1990. So he has a couple of sort of standout movies in for his Hong Kong ones, and then after like Annihilation, that's sort of like his 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 next sort of big one. He does like Beverly Hills Ninja, where he's essentially just you know the sidekick uh, role to Chris Farley. Uh, he does the narration for the uh, documentary on Hong Kong Stump and Red Trousers, which I'd actually recommend checking out. It's really quite interesting. But after that, apart from like his role as 14K in the Death Race films, as we'll talk about in a later episode, um, it's really sort of bit roles, as you said. I mean, he's in Dead or Alive as Pirate Senior. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, he turns up in the god-awful Street Fighter, The Legend of Chung Lee as Gen. And I think it really says everything, really, when uh, you imagine... When uh, you can't remember him actually being in that, but I mean, his last film role was in uh, 2013 with the DTV Death Race 3 Inferno, uh, which isn't bad, um, especially when you compare it to Death Race 2, which is just pretty appalling. But I know that certainly when he's talked about returning to the franchise, he's no interest in doing like the web series, but he's happy to play the Liu Kang role or just to be involved in Mortal Kombat in the film role he'd rather do film work than like TV and web work so uh, Mm -hmm. maybe that's what it is it's just uh, he's holding off for the uh, for Hollywood to come knocking on his door again but uh, I mean he's still he's still fairly young I mean he's like he's not he's born 1960 so he's not really that old I mean he's still I mean look at Donnie Yen he's he's uh, he's really kicking it now you know (laughs) like (laughs) yeah about to say Donnie Yen's now now the uh, the chosen one over at Disney, it seems that since he uh, was in, I mean, since his appearance in Mode 1, he's now attached to Disney's Mulan. It seems that any sort of project that they can attach him to now, they're very keen to, to do the same. And I mean, I would like to see Robin Show come back. I mean, he's still, from what I've seen, he's still looking, he still hasn't seemed to have aged much. I mean... Maybe he do some more uh, video game work. I mean, he did Sleeping Dogs in 2012. Uh, so maybe they bring him f- for the film version of Sleeping Dogs because that's obviously coming up with Donnie Yen again, as you mentioned already. So uh, I don't know. I Maybe it's just me and my f- fanboy obsessions. I just want to see Robin Show come back and do something. So hey, I'm always up for uh, Hong Kong actors getting uh, getting some spot in Hollywood. So, so, you know, I'm behind this all the way. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't mention, um, you know, the 10,000-year-old princess there, uh, Princess Katana, played by Talisa Soto, who I thought she was pretty good. Um, she, she was all right. I, I thought that <laughs> it, was a, <laughs> it, it, was a, it was interesting to watch. She gets, she, I think that if there was anything, I felt like she felt the most out of place in this whole thing. She just kind of popped up. Yeah, I think, I mean, in many ways, she serves to, like, provide this guide uh because obviously we get into the outworld so um for the for the sort of finale and raiden for some reason decides he can't follow so it's like oh finally katana's got a purpose in this because up until this point she sort of turns up and she's like the the mystery woman and she like provide a hint to yeah she's, to how she's to just defeat the, someone or something she was just she was just a sexy sexy pretty lady sitting there with her like guarded by um, Shang Tsung, you know, there, and he, <laughs> it's all we saw, you know, it's just like, they walk by, and she's sitting there, and then there's like, you know, and then eventually, you know, obviously, you know, we see who's, what's guarding her, and there's this kind of like, predator-ish sort of <laughs> effects going on there. Oh, that um, was Reptile. The reptile reveals itself. Um, yeah, yeah, so it... <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, when uh, we talk about things which haven't aged well, Reptile... Is certainly one of those things because, I mean, this is an early CGI effect, and uh, yeah, it's um, it it doesn't look good. <laughs> That's to be sure. It's like whenever I rewatch this, it's sort of like one of the few bits of the film's like, I mean, Goro is a big animatronic creation, and he still looked great. Um, but Reptile is this CGI creature for the most part until he gains his ninja form, and um, yeah, it's it's not good. It, it still looks pretty <laughs> awful. <laughs> yeah, no, but I think that um, here's a really good part because uh, to start talking about just the you, we were talking about that you you had mentioned it before about like seeing Paul Anderson's kind of like um, 
some of his signature things, you know, like uh, I think that there's a lot of nice framing in the film, um, just simply from, you know, entering into the island or just, you know, getting on just a boat as they enter, like as they approach the, 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 the island itself. And there's all these things throughout the film that you start seeing these environments um, and they're so appealing to look at. And it's, it seems like, yeah, obviously, you know it has some age to it right now but you can really easily overlook it because it really does show that the how like the tone of the film and like where it is and the setting really matches everything um yeah yeah i totally agree i mean when you look at it when you look at these sets and especially if you're a fan of the game you can you you can see the you can identify as them being this world i mean as you said already i mean the framing of the shots like when we see all the fighters and they're in the banquet hall and just like when that scene is so fun to look at when you look at all the little details and you see all the different fighters that are taking part in the tournament i mean we also start seeing the trademarks such as we see like the god's eye view so that overhead shot Mm -hmm. um which is so fond of using as well as symmetry when we see the fighters walk along the beach we've got the identical sets of flags we also have bizarrely a guy manning a guest book station which i have no idea why you have someone manning a guest book in a kung fu tournament but still he's there um and we also have a number of anderson's favorite things and that's endless corridors um there's a scene early on where the trio basically uh exploring this palace and they end up in these catacombs and for some reason, uh, Johnny Cage is convinced that he can smell Katana's perfume, as uh, he's, he proudly states, uh, despite the fact that he's constantly leading them through these tunnels which are covered in cobwebs that have clearly not been disturbed. I know, that's what I'm missing. <laughs> and then you're like, you're like, no one move the cobweb. What, she has a way of summoning it or like slipping through it, like, I don't know, phasing through things? I don't know what you're trying to, trying to say there, but... <laughs> so, um... Yeah, I mean, Katana was supposed to have more of a romantic angle with uh, Liu Kang, but because of the amount of action taking place on there, I mean, there was no room to actually put it in. It remains this this sort of underlying theme the uh, of this romantic interest between them. Uh, the same with Johnny Cage and Sonya Blade. We get a little bit of flirtation, mainly on his side, because, you know, he's the, uh, he's the funny guy, he's the hound dog, and uh, yeah... It's I mean it's it's never too invasive. It's I mean Johnny Cage is mainly there to provide the sort of laughs. Uh Liu Kang is there to be our hero and obviously Sonya Blade is there as the the tough chick to basically boss the other two around and, and sort of form the glue of the group. Um and I think to that extent they all work all play their parts well and I think it's also an advantage of that when we look at more combat, I mean, this is a game that only had eight characters in the first game. And unlike Street Fighter, here Anderson's not trying to cram every single character from the games into one film. And yes, we borrow a couple of characters from Mortal Kombat 2, such as Katana and Jax, but we don't go overboard. We have this small amount of characters and you know what each of the characters do, what they all bring to the field. Um, and I think it's... It works all the better, really, because you're not having to constantly make space for all these uh, different sort of characters to appear. But, I mean, clearly Anderson is here enjoying having a bigger budget. We can start to already see the sort of more... That he is much more of a visual director than we got the impression of with shopping, which had, like, occasional flashes of, like, him being stylish with the camera, but at the same time, he's constantly being hindered by what his budget allowed um so having like a a few million to make a a video game movie um he really sort of goes all out and obviously as his budgets get bigger you can see he becomes a lot more stylish with his camera work and certainly with his set design as we obviously talk about more in the films which follow yeah no i mean anderson is very skilled in what he does and i mean it, it also comes in the fact that you know like This is a really, like, just like shopping was a really nice stepping stone for him to get into just the directing world. This is a, this is a really nice stepping stone that we start seeing, like, a lot of the signatures and um, the tone he likes in these films when he does video game adaptations. And that justifies a lot of, like, just, 
you know, where he decides to take his future projects, projects also, and how he decides to approach them. And I guess that also stems from the fact that if you weren't really a fan of Mortal Kombat to begin with, you probably wouldn't be a fan of the other video game adaptations, video game adaptations that he ends up doing, like Resident Evil, for example. Mm. Um, because, you know, the tone is remarkably similar, where there's, like, a lot of, you know, just um, um, kind of, like, uh, you know, cheesy dialogue and <laughs> random, like, one-liners here and there, you know. Um, that, but And that you know, kind of shows the charm of this sort of uh, movie. And, you know, he's really good at, like, building, you know, like, different characters from, like, um, tougher ladies and and stuff like that. You know, it's it really, it, it's, uh, I, I think it's a really nice start for him. Like, Mortal Kombat is pure entertainment. And, um, you know, if you don't get, you know, I know that a lot of people are, especially, you know, people who really like reviewing movies, um, like movie reviewers, movie bloggers, they're, they're very, very like critical about these things that aren't like Oscar nomination films, but you know, this was never meant to be that, I think. And I think for what it was trying to achieve, it achieved exactly that. And it really is for, you know, people who, have really an appreciation for the game itself and the world itself. And, you know, as a video game game adaptation, I really think that this grasps that, you know, that video game world really well. Yeah, it's, um, I think, the, I mean, the, at the end of the day, this was released, this was a summer blockbuster movie. So it's never meant to be the smartest movie uh, ever, ever sort of made. And I think certainly Anson is making this because he knows what sort of film that people who like Mortal Kombat are going to go in wanting to see. And yes, I mean, you mentioned already about the dialogue. Some of it is kind of cheesy. And I think this again has a lot to do with when it's released. I mean, this is mid nineties. So we're not making super serious uh, Mm -hmm. products of like, like comic book movies. Like we see with like uh, the dark Knight. So things are very much treated as, as they are. So, I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, it's a video game movie. And I think, Perhaps to his detriment, the fact that he made both Mortal Kombat and he did the Resident Evil movies. I mean, he did not just one, but several Resident Evil movies. I think in some ways it tarnished a lot of people's opinion of Anderson as a director. They just sort of dismissed him as being or the director of those Resident Evil movies. Um, And I think it's kind of a shame and why certainly what we're doing here on on this season of going back and reevaluating his his work um mm-hmm. it's so important to do because there is a lot more depth to it and there's certainly a lot more style that perhaps went unnoticed when these films were first released and it's a shame really i mean the fact that there are so many like snark casters out there who just like <laughs> love to take a love to just dump all over this film and just like go oh it's so stupid like johnny cage he's just like waka waka sort of guy and it's sort of like yes johnny cage is funny and but his moments provide the lightness when you see Johnny Cage go up against Goro, this like seven foot monster. And <laughs> on top of that, I predicted what he was going to do. <laughs> it's sort of like Johnny at this point, Goro has been basically introduced as like this unstoppable monster. You see like the broken bodies of all these like fighters that he's gone against because a shine to sons like, Oh, we've let the winner through you rounds time for you to have a go. And you just see like bodies being thrown across the, <laughs> the ground from this, like uh, from this unstoppable force. And obviously he's going up against Johnny cage and it's all like, what does Johnny cage do? Oh, I know we're we'll punch him in the knackers and run off because that's what the smart move to do. Um, <laughs> I don't know how it goes in terms of like, him being branded a coward as Raiden highlights is one of his fears. Um, but I mean, it's worth it just for like that whole fight scene is sort of like when Goro breaks his sunglasses and he's like, Oh, those were $500 sunglasses, asshole. It's just, he's <laughs> really, I mean, I, you said the dialogue is kind of cheesy, but at the same time, there's so much dialogue in this. I love to quote such as like when Kano and Goro are having this comparison of their, realms of influence and uh it goes like oh i'm the the prince of the outworld the lord of the underworld and goes like and uh kenna's like underworld is in underground and it's like i'm kind of an underground boss myself back up (laughs) (laughs) yeah no i mean like yeah the the dialogue is the dialogue is i you know i love dialogue like this um 
I love it. And maybe it's because of that I'm a little bit more forgiving for just all of us because I really love entertaining movies. I feel like the world needs more entertaining movies. And in the current day, we don't get enough of them. We just get dumb movies. And this isn't particularly dumb. This is actually pretty smart. You know, there's a lot of really like fun moments and like nice play on words and nice little things like that. And and it all comes together really well, you know, like um, it, it it really does try. Yes, I feel like it, it, it really is supposed to appeal more to the video game now that video game adaptations because I can't say game today. Um <laughs> Like, you know, it goes through the fatality and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> it's so amazing to watch these parts. Um, but, you know, it, it's but it, it's still like, you know, there are people who could really enjoy this kind of movie, especially if you're into entertainment. You know, you just want to sit down, shut your brain off. And I feel that that's like an art that people don't really enjoy anymore. And for that, I think Mortal Kombat, you know, has style. And it delivers on entertainment, and I think that that is fantastic. Yeah, um, unquestionably so. I mean, I still get, as I said already, I still get a thrill of all the stupid one-liners. Just hearing like Ed Boon reprising his voice work for Scorpion for the film. Um, I mean, the creators um, um, actually had a lot of hands-on work on set. I mean, Ed Boon revoiced uh, Scorpion, so. While he's obviously not playing Scorpion, he is providing the voice. So just hearing like the iconic "Get over here" is just oh, it just sends like like chills on my side every time I hear like those iconic words. Or when you see like a character do a move, or like as you said, a fatality from from the game. So when we see like Scorpion do his fire breath, or we see Johnny Cage uh, do the to my biggest fan fatality. Um, it's just like these little these little uh, nods to the game, and it's sort of like it it, it just uh, really sort of adds that extra level if you're a fan uh, to what's already a great film. I mean, it's a uh, at its heart, it's just a fun kung fu movie. Um, and if you're a fan, then you just get this extra level of like seeing all these little nods pepper throughout the game or the film, should I say? Further watching, I mean, obviously this film it was followed by the dreadful Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Uh, which kind of fell into the pitfall of Street Fighter and trying to crap too many movies in there. We had the rather fantastic uh, late night fodder TV show in Mortal Kombat Conquest. We had at one point uh, the director of the Fame remake was doing like a realistic version of Mortal Kombat called Rebirth, which uh, he did as a short film and it got a lot of excitement. And uh, that unfortunately didn't spawn a film version but it did turn into the web series Mortal Kombat Legacy which uh, is well worth checking out but in terms of uh, films I mean further viewing for myself uh, the most obvious one would be the Jean-Claude Van Damme film Bloodsport uh, again it's a film just based around uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme taking part in this like Mortal, this, uh, Mortal Kombat style tournament uh, there's no supernatural element but you get an interesting mix of fighters and you also get to see Bolo Young who is looking an absolute beast in this film as like the big baddie um, my other sort of pick on the more fantastical side of things will be Arena uh, which is from 1989 and this is a sci-fi movie where uh this this guy is basically pitted into an intergalactic fighting contest where he has to fight various different alien sort of races it's much like more combat it's absolutely daft um but it's if you, i think it's a good uh good sort of comparison piece if you're looking for more of the same then uh the arena kind of provides a futuristic twist on uh, what we get here with Mortal combat but kim uh, what would you like to pair with this I think that the obvious choice is that, you know, is what this movie is based on, would be um, Enter the Dragon. <laughs> you would definitely pair it up with Enter as it rips off completely. Yeah, yeah, rips off, exactly. So, yeah, like, like you would def- absolutely, like, definitely pair that with Enter the Dragon. It would be a really good choice. Um, if you were looking for something more of, like, a fighting fighting game, it would be something like Undisputed 2. Um, I say 2 because I've never watched 1. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just remembered Undisputed 2 being really fun to watch. 
Um, it's not no no masterpiece, but you know Scott Atkins is a fantastic actor, and he really like you know has that fun element of just watching him and you know fighting these thing these these people and stuff. Um, but another one I think um, to pair it up would be really nice is I I love to bring this movie up when I get a chance, and um, that's a ninety three um, movie Hong Kong movie called Future Cops. Um, it's based on Street Fighter, but it does so much better than the Street Fighter movie because it t- it tries to really like limit itself and, and it kind of gives you that kind of like using these characters they enter into a different story and there's a lot of like you know there's not there's a lot of humor that works here um, not I, I wouldn't say there's a whole lot of fighting but as a game that as like a movie that uses video game characters I think it does a really really great job and I think that for that video game link it's a really nice pairing. Very nice. Um, well, that brings us to the end of uh, this episode of Movies and Tea. Uh, if you would like to uh, check out our archive, you can do it at moviesandteapodcast.wordpress.com. We are also on Facebook and Twitter, as well as Instagram. Uh, the links for all those you can find on both the blog or just by uh, going to the respective channels and uh, searching for Movies and Tea. Um, we are available on both Podomatic and iTunes, so uh, if you happen to be leaving listen to us on either of those platforms then uh please do hit that like or subscribe button and uh, maybe leave us some nice words leave us a review because it all uh, helps to get the show a bit more noticed helps us push us up the itunes rankings and uh gets more people to uh discover the show so but uh thank you of course for uh listening and uh thank you as always to my co-host miss kimlo <laughs> thank you for everyone for listening and uh, Kim, I mean, what are we going to be looking at next in this retrospective? Looking at um, 1997's Event Horizon. Um, that's a horror thriller, I'd like to call it. Horror sci-fi thriller. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for listening. And uh, until next time. Sometimes people ask me, how did I become what I am? Well, I'll tell you what I remember. I remember as a kid, I used to play with my friends. We'd sword fight with sticks that we made from tree limbs. But times were kind of difficult, our family's different clans. Told us we couldn't be together, we had different paths. Whenever I got older, had a family of my own. A wife and a son, we were happy in our home. We trained together, teach them how to live a life of honor. There is no greater love than the love of a father. And then one day I had to go away for a while. Regrettably left my wife home alone with my child. My village was pillaged, they killed everyone I loved. I didn't even question who I knew, just who it was. Sub-Zero, a ninja, the friend that I once knew. We look almost alike except he wears the color blue. His clan is cold and heartless and their evil knows no end. But I battle for my family, their blood I will avenge. You wanna go? Let's get it on. I guarantee that this won't last long. Ready for battle? You better be. Cause this is Mortal Kombat, you're my enemy, yeah. You wanna go? Let's get it on. I guarantee that this won't last long. Ready for battle? You better be. Cause this is Mortal Kombat, you're my enemy. This is a war. And I'm the scorpion This fire burns inside, I'm a champion I battle in this tournament against warriors Both mortal and immortal from all over the world They call it Mortal Kombat and yeah it's just that I'm even taking on robot Cyrax You don't know what you're in for, Sector By the time I'm finished with you, you'll be sore Bringing fire with eternal burning desire You might think you're a god raiding, but I'm the messiah Your skills are pathetic, you better watch your back Cause I'll cut off your electric and I'll smash that hat Not to forget Jax, Kano and Sonya Blade You better fear the spear, gonna bring the pain You got guns and bombs, but I can't be stopped I'm here to leave my legacy straight to the top, come on You wanna go, let's get it on I guarantee that this won't last long Ready for battle? You better be Cause this is Mortal Kombat, you're my enemy, yeah You wanna 
go Let's get it on I guarantee that this won't last long Ready for battle? You better be Cause this is Mortal Kombat You're my enemy Let's get it on I hope you enjoyed this song. If you did, consider leaving this video a thumbs up. If you'd like to download the MP3, you can find it by searching for Brysai on iTunes and Android. I appreciate your support, and I hope you have a marvelous day.